1 Peter chapter 4, 7 through 11. And you'll notice the title there. Someone came to me this morning and said, Hey, Wayne, you forgot your title. I said, No, I did put the title in. My title for the message is March 5th, 2014. March 5th, 2014. Today is January 5th, 2014. And my challenge to us today is, what would you do differently if you knew Jesus and His judgment were coming in two months? If you knew that on March 5th, 2014, Jesus' return was coming. I might be shooting a little high. He might come before then, but He very well could come in two months from today. How would you live your life differently? I put this as a title to kind of challenge us because the very first seven words say the end of all things is near. And if I can encourage you, take your bulletin, just circle that, highlight that something. If there's one thing you'll take away from this whole message, Jesus' return is near. Peter writes, the end of all things is near. Now, familiarity breeds contempt. Most of us have known about Jesus' return for many years and kind of like, yeah, I know that, I know that. It won't happen. I'll die when I'm 84. Maybe, but maybe his return really is near. And Peter was telling the truth, and God is forewarning us through this passage of Scripture. The end of all things is near. The fulfillment, everything that and the history of the world is coming to a fulfillment, and Peter writes this in verse 7, the end of all things is near. Now I know when I say that, we have three people groups here. People group number one are the unsaved. And they say, man, if I only have two months to live, what would I do differently? I'd eat, drink, and be merry. How do I know that? For 29 years, I was not a Christian. And if someone would have told me, hey, you got a year to live or two months to live, Man, I would have done some really immoral things leading up and get as much joy out of this world as I could before I was going to die or before Jesus was going to return. So if you're the unsaved here, this really message is not for you. Uh, but maybe you're sitting here and you would be what I would call a nominal Christian. You're kind, of, you're kind of in, kind of not. You're a Christian with a small c. You come to church, but Jesus isn't your treasure He's not the Lord of your life. You don't seek him. You don't follow him. You're just kind of a churchton, a nominal Christian. And uh, I would encourage you today with these words. The end of all things is near, and you will be judged. And if you do not have Jesus Christ on that great and dreadful day, it's not going to go well for you, nominal Christian. Flee to Jesus. Flee to Jesus today. If you have been coming to church for a while and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ, don't feel bad and like, oh, I haven't done that. Seek your ABF leader this uh, second hour. Come talk to Darren or me after the service or find Spencer. He's walking around and say, you know, I'm not really sure if I'm ready to meet God. If you're a nominal Christian here today, my word to you from this book is the end of all things is near. I met with a 22-year-old girl that attends this church occasionally, and she said, I need to talk to you. Her and her boyfriend came. We went to Starbucks. This is Thursday, and I laid out how to be saved, that Jesus cries out, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in spirit, and you will find rest for your soul. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. I told this young lady, I said, Jesus is calling you. Come to him. Repent of your sins. Trust Jesus and his finished work alone, not what you can do. You're not a good person. You're a sinner sinful person. Repent. Trust in Jesus Christ alone and he will save you. And the end is near, I told her. And I said, he will save you. He is faithful. And she said, what must I do to be saved? I said, get along with God and cry out to him and say, have mercy on me, a sinner. She already believed that Jesus died and rose again. She believed the biblical facts, but she had never received him by faith. So I got a text Thursday. She's like, I'm trying, but I don't know. And then on uh, Saturday, yesterday, I get a text. She said, I gave my soul to Jesus. I thought, praise the Lord. She's in, serve, she's in church right now. She's in an ABF class right now. I saw her walk in. God is doing this. And if you're here today and you're a nominal Christian kind of on the fence playing the game, repent today and trust Jesus Christ alone. He died for you. As a matter of fact, I'd just like to pray for those folks right now. If you're already a Christian here, pray with me for those who are in this room right now that if Jesus were to return, they would not be ready. Lord, I don't have the ability to change a human heart, so I call upon you with my brothers and sisters, and I pray for the person sitting in this room who, if truth were known, their heart's burning a mile a minute right now, and they're saying, God, I'm not ready to meet you. Oh, Jesus, I pray you would save another sinner today. Save one who claims you but doesn't love you or live for you or know you. I pray, Lord Jesus, for that nominal Christian today. Save their soul on this wintry, blustery January 5th day so that they'll be ready for the end of all things is near, whether it's March 5th or it's March 5th, 
$20.99 that they would be ready to meet you. And Jesus, I pray you'd have mercy on them today. In your name I pray, amen. Well, the rest of this message is for the born-again Christians in 1 Peter chapter 1. says we've been uh, granted mercy into a, a, a living hope. So we have been given a new birth through Jesus Christ. So the rest of this message is for born-again Christians who are eagerly ready and waiting and preparing to meet Jesus. This message is for you. Now, the early church thought that Jesus was going to return at any time. And uh, 1 John 3, 3 says, everyone who has this hope that Jesus could return imminently at any moment, it says every, everyone who has this hope purifies himself. Basically, what it's saying, I think, is, man, if Jesus is coming back, I better alter my life so that I'm ready to meet him, so I can joyously meet my Savior when he comes. Everyone who has this hope of the imminent return of Jesus Christ purifies himself. So verse 7, the end of all things is near. Therefore, if this is true, if the end of all things is near, this is our impotence to what? First of all, be clear-minded. Uh, another translation said sober-minded, and it, it drew me back to when, uh, before I was a Christian, I used to drink too much, and I would get drunk. And I remember one of the things we used to do at the end of the, uh, the next morning, we'd say, hey, I got overserved last night. We'd make a big joke, all my drinking buddies. Oh, I got overserved too. I got overserved. And I think if we're uh, not clear-minded, uh, we're going to be overserved with the things of this world. We're not going to be sober-minded about eternal things. We're going to be overserved with things like my career is the most important thing. Uh, my job, I got to make sure my job and or my money, I need my money, and we get overserved on these things. And we're not clear-minded, we're cloudy-minded because we're not sober-minded or clear-minded. We're overserved with the things of this world. Sports team, that's consuming me right now, and we're not clear-minded. And God's saying to the worldly-minded, cloudy-minded person, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. And as Christians, so often our minds can get cloudy and we're not clear-minded. So don't be overserved with recreation. Don't be overserved in your relationships. Don't be overserved in physical fitness. Don't let any of those things cloud your mind, any of those earthly things, which are good, mind you. But be clear-minded. Peter says, be clear-minded. And what is the second part? And self-controlled. I think this is a big problem for the Christian church today. I think uh, the world seduces us to fulfill ourselves. Self becomes a God. And we want to not be self-controlled. We want to fulfill self, not control ourself, but we want to fulfill ourself. And uh, I think when we get saved, we remember that guy Copernicus that had that, uh, where he figured out, oh, wait, the uh, sun doesn't revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. And when we get saved, we realize, oh, this whole thing isn't about me, it's about God, and we revolve around him. He doesn't revolve around us, but how easy it is to slip back into self-focused, and it's all about me, it's all about my thing. And I think in this self-crazed society, I just wrote down three things we have that we want to say, look at me, look at me, go to my Facebook page, look what I'm all about, look what I do, look at me, self. We go to Twitter account, look what I thought up, look what I have to say, look what I'm doing. And then Instagram, a little combo of both, look at me, look at me, look at me. And we're fulfilling self. And Jesus says through Peter here, therefore be clear-minded and self-controlled. Control yourself. In school, I remember I took a class, uh, psychology, and Maslow had this thing, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And the, the number one thing you could get is self-actualization. I'm fulfilled. It's all about me. And then Jesus comes along when we get saved. He says, if any man come after me, he must deny himself. Not fulfill self, deny self. Take up your cross daily and follow me. He says, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses my, his life for me and my sake will gain it. So today, Jesus tells us, be self-controlled. Uh, and I think, how can we be self-controlled? I was at, a, I was at a, a, a conference this week, and a man named Richard Chin spoke. And he talked about, what does it look like, self-denial? And he put this to words. He said, Jesus' pleasure over my pleasure. I thought that was good. I want to do what Jesus wants me to do more than I want to do. That's denying self. Will you do that in 2014, brothers and sisters in Christ? Do you realize that the end of all things is near? He says, therefore, be clear-minded, sober-minded, and self-controlled. Wayne, why should I do all that? What's the big deal? Why should I do that? And it says the end of our verse here, verse 7, it says, so that you can pray. And every person I've ever witnessed to, any person I've ever talked to, says the same thing. Oh, I pray, I pray. And I don't doubt that. I think everybody prays. Everybody prays occasionally, shoots something up to God. 
But this isn't just talking about praying. This is talking about so we can effectively, intelligently, appropriately pray. If we're not clear-minded, if we're not self-controlled because we see the end of all things is near and we're not those things, our prayers are going to look more self-focused. God, give me what, what I want. Give me what I want, God. And that's kind of a self-focused prayer. A Godward-focused prayer prays something along the lines, God, what do you want? What do you want? And that's what we want for us in 2014 and beyond. We want to be Godward focused in our prayers because the end of all things is near. Therefore, we must be clear-minded and self-controlled so that we can effectively, intelligently, and appropriately pray and not just pray selfishly like we're prone to do. Well, the passage goes on, and we'll go through these a little bit quicker. Verse 8, above all, so above great faith, above great hope is love. He says, above all, the end of all things is near, thus, above all, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. The author knows that loving people is not easy. It doesn't come naturally. It's hard to love people. It's hard for me to love people. It's easy for me to love myself. It's hard for me to love you guys. He says it's hard. So it takes a fervent straining of yourself. Not a cold, indifferent, lukewarm love for others, but actually something that extends yourself where you want to love each other deeply thought about Peter writing this, and I thought his mind might have gone back to two times. Probably could have gone back to a lot, but he probably remembered that. Remember the sinful woman that came to Jesus? She had been forgiven, and she pours the perfume on his body, and she got tears on his uh, feet and washes his feet with her hair. She had been forgiven much, and she loved much as a result. And maybe Peter's writing this down. Uh, Love covers a multitude of sins. Man, I remember that woman. She had more sins than anyone. She was a very immoral woman, and Jesus' love had forgiven her all her sins. But I think maybe more so, Peter might have gone back to 30 years before. And uh, think about 30 years before. That would be 1984. Most of us can remember 1984, and you can draw back some memories. Maybe Peter's remembering 30 years before when he said, I don't know Jesus. I don't know Jesus. And the third time, he, he cursed and said, I don't know the man. And then a little bit later, Jesus is resurrected, and Jesus, remember, went at the shore where they're eating the fish, and he says, Peter, remember what he said to him? Do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And then the third time he said it, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, you know all things, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus was reinstating Peter after his thrice denial. Three times he asked Peter, do you love me? And Peter's writing back, he's like, man, you think that woman screwed up her life? I denied the Lord of the universe three times. And he restored me three times. That's love. I love God because he first loved me. And uh, Darren touched on it a little bit, but where are we going to find love today? I think the greatest place to find love in this church today is in our ABF classes. Uh, I wrote this down in a loving community. Sins are repented of, forgiven, overlooked, and covered. I've heard more sin coming out of our ABF class than I've ever heard in my life. And you know what? It's covered. The blood of Jesus Christ has covered it. They're forgiven. And man, when you've been forgiven of some sin, it's real easy to show love and acceptance and forgiveness to your fellow brothers and sisters who have also screwed things up. In a loving community, sins are repented of, forgiven, and overlooked. And love will cover over a multitude of sins. I thought about John Newton, that great author uh, of the song Amazing Grace, and he was a slave trader. At the end of his life, he said this, My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. One, I am a great sinner, and two, Christ is a great Savior. He took my epitaph for my funeral. That's what I want. Wayne was a great sinner, but Christ is a great Savior. And if you can say that today about yourself, you get the gospel. That's what the gospel is saying. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. We've got to move on, verse 9. The end of all things is near. Thus, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now, in those days... Inns were a very dangerous place for Christians traveling to stay. They were filled with uh, immorality, and it's dangerous. Uh, churches met in homes for the first couple hundred years. There was no church, so people would meet in homes, and you needed a hospitable Christian to let them stay in their home. Uh, I thought about a couple illustrations, but one just last week. I went to this conference, this cross-con conference. Remember the Indian man and his wife that gave testimony two weeks ago? Joel Joseph's his name. We drove with him, and he said, Wayne, I'll drive. It's like, wow, you're offering hospitality. And then my 13-year-old son went with me to the conference. He's like, Wayne, what would be a treat for Caleb? 
I said, ah, he loves beef jerky. He got like four pounds of beef jerky. That's offering hospitality. And he's like, I'll drive both ways, six hours to Louisville, never grumbling, never complaining. That's just a real practical way to love other people by showing hospitality. Now go and do the same in 2014. God says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, offer hospitality one another. Here's the rub, without grumbling. I can offer hospitality, but in my spirit, when are they going to leave? Holy cow, they didn't take their shoes off. No, without grumbling. God loves a cheerful giver. Be cheerful when you bless the body. We have to move on. Verse 10, love and action. The end of all things is near. Thus, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithful administering God's grace in its various forms. You don't use your gifts to puff yourself up. Look what a good boy am I. I have this gift. God gave me this. No, it's not meant for pride, and it's not meant to be jealous because he's got better things than I do. No, our gifts, our spiritual gifts are used. We're all parts of one body, and we're used to build one another up in the most holy faith. Darren and I have totally different gifts. We can easily be jealous of each other's gifts, or I can say, man, I really appreciate how God has gifted Darren different than me. It's our choice. So use your gifts Not to puff up, not to be jealous, but what does it say? To serve others. In 2014, use your gifts to serve other people. Don't hog it to yourself and think how great you are, or don't be discouraged because you don't have something as exciting as Darren. Be happy with the gifts God has given you and serve the body with that because the end of all things is near. Verse 11, last verse, and we'll land the plane. The end of all things is near, brothers and sisters. Therefore... If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. We're really big into Christians speaking truth to one another here at this church. If there's anything you can do to put a smile on any of the pastor's faces, say, you know, I took a guy out to Starbucks and I I just built up spiritual truth in him and I just shared the word with him and he shared the word with me and we saw where each other was at. We spoke truth to each other. It says, if anyone speaks, he should do it as speaking the very words of God. I want a favorite passage of of the Old Testament is Malachi 3.16. It was the dark days uh, for faith in those days. And uh, listen to what this says. You can look to it later. It says, Those who feared the Lord talked to one another, and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. God hears and listens when you speak truth and you plant seeds of faith into your brothers and sisters throughout this congregation and even outside of this congregation. Speak the words of truth. If anyone speaks, he should do the very words of God. Then he goes on, if anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. You want to serve others? Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light shine before men so that they may see your good deeds and praise you. No, praise your Father who's in heaven. We do good things in God's strength so people will say, what a great God he serves. And then the last part, to him, to him, to Jesus, to him be the glory and the power forever. And don't forget, brothers and sisters, when you speak, when you serve, when you offer hospitality, when you love others deeply, don't take the glory for yourself. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. It's all about Jesus. Well, we got through those verses pretty fast. In all seriousness, The end of all things is near. And I would not be surprised if we don't live out 2014 and Jesus returns in this year. Are you ready? Are you ready, nominal Christian? Are you ready to meet your God and give an account for your life? Are you ready, brother and sister in Christ? Are you ready to meet this one who died for you? The end of all things is near. Maybe even March 5th, 2014. Let me pray. Father, I've been in many hospitals and uh, I've seen a lot of people who were given two months to live. Man, their priorities changed. Oh, they regretted so many things they trifled with in this world and they desperately wanted to see you. So Lord, I pray we have a little warning from our brother Peter who thought you were going to return in his lifetime and it didn't happen. Lord, I believe you're going to return in our lifetime and I believe it's going to happen. So Lord, I pray that we'd be prepared and ready we be self-controlled and alert. I pray, Lord Jesus, that uh, you would come. Uh, Maranatha, come, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, uh, for this day. I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that are here, that uh, brave the elements, and I pray, Lord, that you would reward them greatly 
uh, for their seeking after you this day. I love you, Lord Jesus, and we thank you for First Peter. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.